I am very late on this one. Strike. Okay, this is a twofer due to similar demands, same union, and that the Boston VNA workers and the St. Vincent nurses supported each other's picket lines. Plus, I'm so far behind, so I have to smush some things together. Eight months ago, 700, now 800 nurses, represented by the Massachusetts Nurses Association, walked off the job at St. Vincent's Hospital March 8th, 2021 and haven't returned since and the workers at boston vna or the boston visiting nurses association striked for a week for their very first union contract july 26 to august 1st 2021 what's happening Oh boy, there's a lot. I'm eight months behind on this strike, so stick with me as I speed run all the events on Tenet Healthcare's and Boston VNA's chicanery. Let's go. Tenet Healthcare, the for profit healthcare company that owns St. Vincent's Hospital, has a long pattern of putting profits over patients, a pattern that has been exasperated by the coronavirus pandemic and the nursing shortage. Tenet Healthcare has paid $1.8 billion for so many labor violations and patient safety violations, I couldn't list them all, including firing nurses for reporting patient deaths due to Tenet Healthcare's hospital policies, pushing patients to get unnecessary internal cardiac monitors and surgery, and creating an unsafe workplace. In the year leading up to the strike, the nurses at St. Vincent Hospital filed over 600 unsafe staffing reports that informed management that these conditions threatened their patient safety. When tenant healthcare management didn't take steps to safeguard patients and nurses, after two years, the St. Vincent nurses had no choice but to strike. In 2019, the workers at Boston VNA voted to unionize under the MNA umbrella. A VNA is a home health care company. For a year and a half, the newly unionized workers were bargaining for their very first union contract. But after Boston VNA rejected all their demands, the workers went on a one week strike in order to bring Boston VNA back to the table. What are their goals? Boston VNA's workers want to limit patient caseloads. They want affordable health care, 401k, sick days, bereavement days, a wage scale, a just cause clause, and grievance language. The Boston VNA is made up of speech therapists, social workers, physical therapists, and occupational therapists, etc., etc. Their job is to wash out over patients recovering from strokes, heart attacks, surgery, accidents, etc., etc. Instead of recovering in a hospital, a VNA lets people recover in the comfort of their homes. Oh God, I sound like a commercial. Care. We pride ourselves in delivering outstanding care. When you and your family need help, look no further. The patients are vulnerable to neglect and illness if the VNA workers aren't able to achieve their goals. Large caseloads limit the amount of time and care each patient receives. The healthcare professionals, or HCP, are left rushing from patient to patient, which can lead to errors that compromise the patient's health. Without affordable health care, the HCPs ironically can't see a doctor. While they're giving medical care, they can't receive medical care themselves. And sick days are especially important when working with vulnerable populations. If a HCP person is sick without sick days, they can't take time off and risk getting their patients sick. That's so fucking dangerous. Imagine what would happen if their patients are immunocompromised. And not giving workers bereavement days is just humane. Bereavement days are days the workers can take off when a family member dies. Forcing people to work while they're dealing with a tragedy will affect the workers' ability to take care of their patients. I don't particularly like 401ks because it relies on the market being favorable. Pensions are better by far, but a 401k is better than nothing. 
because everyone will grow old and need to retire. A wage scale is an agreement in the union contract that outlines how and when the wage will increase. The increases are determined by the amount of time someone's been working at the company. Wage scales are a standard in union contracts that provide for fair and transparent pay increases and help with recruitment and retention. Just cause clauses guarantee that workers can't be fired or disciplined without a justification. Ed. And grievance language lays out a system for how to report and handle workers' grievances such as when a company is ignoring workers reporting unsafe working conditions, as Boston v has been doing. The recent trend in healthcare has been to move away from in-hospital treatment to at-home treatment. Part of this is because hospitals are not fun and people prefer to recover at home. And the other more cynical part is for cost-cutting measures. By moving people to home, it frees up beds and services at the hospital and the health care company doesn't need to pay overhead for the patient's food and board. I think this trend to home health care is a good thing. I have my own home health aid. But without sick days, health insurance, bereavement days, and limited patient caseloads, patients and the HCP are being put in danger so that large for-profit health care companies can save a few bucks. The Boston VNA workers ended their strike August 1st and are back to bargaining with Boston VNA. Let us all pray that they achieve all their goals for their safety and for their patients. The most we can do at the moment is just keep an ear to the ground and see if they need to strike again. And when they do, support. St. <laughs> Vincent nurses want to improve unsafe patient care conditions, just like the Boston VNA. Patients at St. Vincent's and all of Tenet Healthcare's hospitals experience increased risk for falls, bed sores, infection, medication delays, and death due to Tenet Healthcare's cost cutting measures. Tenant Healthcare cut back on services, beds, and staff, leaving their hospitals overwhelmed. The ideal nurse to patient ratio is 1 to 4. Tenant Healthcare's nurse to patient ratio ranges from 1 to 10 to 20, depending on the day, which is bad. Very bad. A Lancet study found that increasing the nurse's workload by one patient increases the chance of death by 7%. And a BMJ quality and safety study showed that higher patient loads were associated with higher hospital readmission. And an American Journal of Infection Control showed that increasing a nurse's workload by one patient increased chances of urinary tract infection and surgical site infections. And a medical care study showed that higher nurse staffing levels mean fewer deaths, lower failure to rescue incidents, lower rates of infection, and shorter hospital stays. And I could go on, but you get the idea. So um, let's look at the five-day forecast, and we'll see the temperatures are still fluctuating, but the chances of death have stabilized at about 99.99%. Jeffrey Eichenlaub, a nurse and one of the initial whistleblowers, reported that seven nurses were scheduled to cover 130 patients that night. Each emergency nurse would have had to care for up to 20 patients at once. The ED was still short-staffed. Beds, equipment, and oxygen were scarce. The hospital was a war zone. There were patients lying everywhere. Despite Eichenlaub's protection under the Whistleblower Protection Act, Tenet Healthcare retaliated by firing them and the other three nurses who came forward. Marie Rotaco, an RN, described situations where nurses had to do so much in a single shift they were unable to bathe, turn, wash, or walk patients. She said one nurse she knows found herself in a situation where she had to choose between protecting a patient who was going to fall out of a bed or respond 
to a call from a patient with chest pain with no backup in sight. Tenant Healthcare CEO Carolyn Jackson responded by denying that staffing ever approached an illegal or dangerous range. In order to address patient safety, the nurses want three policies implemented. One, staffing guidelines that ensure that all nurses have enough support staff when caring for patients. A particular concern is the emergency department and the surgical floors where any delay in care received could make the difference between life and death. Nurses want improved limits on the amount of patients assigned to each nurse and a resource nurse who would be able to coordinate care and assign nurses accordingly. Number two, a creation of a pool of expert nurses to handle critically ill patients so that patients in the ICU intensive care unit don't die. And number three, stat and rapid response nurses who are on hand for emergencies when a patient is coding or suffer a serious immediate decline so that already overworked nurses don't have to abandon their own patients when emergencies occur. And you want to know the craziest thing? They got it. Tenant Healthcare agreed to all their demands and the new contract with improved staffing guidelines. So why are the St. Vincent nurses still on strike? Tomfoolery, nursing shortage, the state of prof for-profit healthcare, and retaliation. The nursing shortage is making the whole situation worse. As the American population ages, the need for nurses grow, but at the same time, due to the high cost of education and the capacity problems at nursing schools, there aren't enough people training to be nurses. In 2019, according to a report on enrollment in nursing, U.S. nursing schools turned away 80,407 applicants due to insufficient number of faculty, clinical sites, classroom space, and budget constraints. And the majority of the nursing population is nearing retirement age. Estimates show that 1 million nurses will retire by 2030, and we just don't have enough people to replace them. Add to that the high rates of burnout in the nursing field. Older experienced nurses are leaving the field, whether voluntarily or because of COVID, because they're dying. Due to unsafe working conditions, higher patient loads and stress, more and more nurses are burning out and the turnover rate is so high. Ironically, it's the state of nursing with insufficient staffing and cost-cutting measures that's driving nurses away. The state of nursing and Massachusetts study is very concerning. It shows a downward trend in patient care quality because of unsafe patient assignments, less time for patients, and the lack of workplace safety. 20% of the nurses said that they had contracted COVID, and 76% of them said they'd contracted COVID at work. Coronavirus exasperated existing problems like mental health boarding and emergency departments, emergency department overcrowding, nurse burnout, and turnover. Emergency department overcrowding is when the demand for emergency services exceed the ability of physicians and nurses to provide quality of care within a reasonable time. ED overcrowding is caused by pre-hospital factors like people not having access to a primary care physician probably because they don't have insurance, as well as in-hospital factors like a lack of support staff. ED overcrowding leads to longer wait times, delays in diagnosis, delays in treatment, decreased quality of care, medical error, and poor patient outcome, which can ultimately lead to death. ERs are also overcrowded because they cannot turn away uninsured patients, unlike doctor's offices or urgent care centers. Thus, for the uninsured, the ER is their only option of medical treatment. To be clear, this is not the fault of the uninsured, but rather the fault of our healthcare system for forming these large gaps in coverage. An easy solution would be to have universal health care so that everyone is insured, but something, something, money, something, something, bootstraps. Yeah. That makes sense. ED overcrowding is also caused by patients with chronic conditions, since the ER is not set up to help people with chronic illnesses. The most they can do is hook you up to an IV, tell you to see your doctor, and fat shame you a little bit. 
There is a disconnect in American healthcare with connecting chronically ill patients to long-term services. Solution, just have a separate department that can handle chronically ill patients and connect them to long-term services, but that would require hiring more staff. Mental health boarding creates a slowdown, which compounds the problem of ED overcrowding. The average wait time for mental health patients in American ERs is 12 hours. That's 12 hours without those beds available. The one study showed that some patients can wait up to 96 hours for placement if the person is uninsured or intoxicated. I myself once waited 24 hours for a bed. Mental health boarding makes up 14% of ER visits but accounts for 71% of emergency department boarding. For-profit healthcare kills. The corporate takeover of healthcare, whether by for-profit companies or enormous non-profit organizations that pay their executive millions, has hurt the ability of frontline nurses and healthcare workers to provide the quality of care our patients deserve, MNA President Katie Murphy, an ICU nurse, said. Cost-cutting measures such as not stocking extra supplies, closing services, eliminating beds, and understaffing cost lives. When the pandemic hit, hospitals did not have the PPE or personal protection equipment needed to safeguard patients and hospital workers because it cost money to keep extra PPE stock on hand, so hospitals just didn't. This left their hospitals, particularly for-profit hospitals, woefully unprepared for a pandemic. Hospitals lacked PPE, ventilators, sanitizing supplies, medicine, and toilet paper. So stupid. <laughs> ah, I dropped one. It put us way behind the eight ball in how hospitals were able to respond and contain COVID. Nurses were 12 times more likely to contract COVID, and this created strain at home because nurses were forced to quarantine separate from their families. 9% of hospitals nationwide have closed or merged. 40 hospitals have closed since the start of the pandemic. This has created a huge burden on our healthcare system as more demand is put on the open hospitals, but oftentimes there are no services to replace the closed ones. And yes. Oh, I'll take two. Sorry, we are closed. There is a push by nursing unions around the country for legislation that would guarantee whenever a healthcare company closes or merges hospitals, they must prove that there is no loss of service. Fingers crossed it passes. All hail S.754 slash H.1253. An act relative to the closing of hospital essential services. According to the American Hospital Association, the number of inpatient beds has decreased by 39%. Eliminating beds allows hospitals to operate at a high census. A census level is an average of how many patients a doctor can process through the ER in a day. The higher the census, the more patients, and the more money, and the more efficient a hospital looks to possible investors. The problem is, a high census means less time for each patient. It's more focused on how quick a patient can get in and out rather than the quality of care. This is dangerous. It pushes the staff to focus more on speed than what the patient needs, and they could easily miss something. Less beds mean that the hospitals can't handle any fluctuations in inpatient demand, such as, crazy example, during a pandemic. <laughs> I've already discussed earlier how understaffing ERs can lead to death through ED overcrowding. But for-profit hospitals are trying to make up the difference by forcing mandatory overtimes on their staff. Tired, overworked nurses are more likely to make deadly medical errors. The rate of medical errors increases as the amount of time nurses have with each patient decreases and the lack of sleep nurses have. 31% of deaths in hospitals are connected to ED overcrowding. These deaths are entirely preventable, especially deaths due to ambulance divergence. 
When the ER is full, the ambulance has to drive to another hospital farther away, delaying timely emergency care. With adequate staffing less levels, hospitals would have dedicated response staff on hand for emergencies so that already overworked nurses wouldn't be forced to abandon and neglect their patients. But more staff means more money, and for-profit healthcare wants to get rid of as many expenses as possible. While these changes may make sense from a financial perspective, these cost containment strategies fail to take into account the human toll and put patients at risk for treatment delays and bad outcomes. And, fun fact, while public hospitals experienced a huge drop in revenue during the pandemic, for-profit hospital revenue increased by billions of dollars because stonks. It's extremely important to have safe conditions across the board in all hospitals. Life and death important. It's impossible to comparison shop during a medical emergency, if your health insurance even gives you the option. When you go to a hospital, you're putting a tremendous amount of trust in absolute strangers. You trust that the healthcare company running the hospital has bothered to make sure that you'll be taken care of and not taken care of. When you're in an ambulance, you can request which hospital you want to go to. But to do that, you need to know what hospital you want to go to. Now, as a chronically ill cutie, I've been to many hospitals. I know which one I want to go to based on the experience I've had. Don't go to the Meadows. But for most people, they wouldn't know, and the decision would be completely out of their control. They could easily be sent to a tenant healthcare owned hospital because tenant owns many hospitals across the country. And finally, that brings us to why tenant healthcare doesn't want to let the nurses come back to work. They have refused to provide a return to work provision. In labor collective bargaining, at the end of a strike, the union and the employer will agree on a return to work provision that outlines how and when the workers can get back to work. It's just general procedure to give the striking workers their jobs back because they have the experience needed to perform those jobs. Tenant healthcare is taking a different route. Uh, they're hiring inexperienced nurses to replace the striking nurses. The statement by the MNA says, Tenet is insisting on callously displacing the seasoned clinicians with replacements, nearly half of whom were newly graduated or novice nurses, many working in highly specialized areas such as the maternity unit, where no nurse with that level of experience should be allowed to practice independently. Chris Donahue, RN, a nurse with 35 years experience in maternity care, says to put them, the inexperienced nurses, in that position is dangerous for the patients and unfair to those nurses, particularly now when we are dealing with the unique issues presented by COVID-19. Marlena Pellegrino, RN, a longtime nurse at the hospital, and co-chair of the nurses' local bargaining unit with the Massachusetts Nurses Association says, we have verified reports of newly hired nurses choosing to leave after experiencing the condition inside the hospital, including one floor where nearly every newly hired nurse left within a few weeks. Again, this is another dangerous decision made by Tenet Healthcare to save money since they can pay inexperienced nurses less. But the main reason is that Tenet Healthcare wants to intimidate the nurses at their other hospitals to make sure they don't strike. The conditions at St. Vincent's are the same in all of Tenet Healthcare's hospitals. If the St. Vincent nurses are successful, the other nurses might get ideas. Tenant Healthcare filed an impasse with the MNA union. An impasse is a declaration that the company and the union cannot form an agreement. If a good faith impasse is reached, 
Then Tenant Healthcare can break off negotiations, stop paying unemployment benefits, and implement their last proposal. But has a good faith impasse been reached? No. A good faith impasse requires the tenant health care not engage in retaliatory behavior, which tenant health care uh, has by refusing to let the nurses return to work and adding pay increases for the nurses that did not strike. Tenant health care is clearly punishing the nurses for striking, which is stupid and dangerous. The MNA has filed a labor violation with the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board. The 8th won this strike. The previous labor violations were filed after Tenant Healthcare falsely reported organizing nurses for violating safe work policies to the Board of Registered Nurses, which could have cost the nurses their licenses. To date, we have charged Tenet with a total of eight unfair labor practices that allege unlawful threats against nurses for striking or engaging in strike-related activities, retaliation and discrimination against striking nurses for engaging in the strike and strike-related activities, and rewarding non-striking nurses with preferred assignments in return for their refusal to honor the strike, said Merlina Pellegrino, RN. These charges are extremely serious as they allege significant unlawful interference in the strike and extremely troublesome behavior by hospital management. Tenant Healthcare is refusing to renegotiate until the MNA drops all charges of unfair labor practices. If the NLRB finds Tenant Healthcare and the union did not reach a good faith impasse, then they'll have to go back to the table and pay some hefty fines. But at the moment, both sides are at a stalemate, and Massachusetts is down 800 nurses during a nationwide nurse shortage and a pandemic. So that's fun. Tenant Healthcare is spending a bananas amount of money to prolong the strike. $5.4 million a week for replacement nurses and $32,000 a day for the police detail at the strike. The strike's been going on for eight months now, so that's about $172.8 million for the nurses and $716,800 for the police. And Tenant Healthcare can afford that because they made a profit of $4.7 billion this pandemic. I guess the cost-benefit analysis showed that it was cheaper to prolong the strike and endanger patients and nurses instead of getting their shit together. Well, if, I, if I could just play devil's advocate for a second. Okay. Instead of the refinery, have we considered selling our souls to the devil for immortality? <laughs> Excellent idea, Chris. Yes, thank you. Immortality. I, I'm sorry, did you hear what he just said? Oh, you're right. We should definitely think this through. Um, Darla, can you give me a cost-benefit analysis on Chris's proposal? Sure. It looks like the main benefit is immortality. Oh. And the primary cost would be selling our souls to the devil. Great, moving on. How do we support the workers? Share. Social media links in the doobly-doo. Donate. Links to donate through PayPal or Venmo down below. MNA also accepts checks made payable to the MNA St. Vincent Nurses Strike Fund. Mail them to MNA Nurses Strike Fund, Massachusetts Nurses Association, 340 Turnpike Street, Canton, Massachusetts, 02021. The MNA also has frequent raffles to fundraise for the strike. Check out their website, massnurses.org, to find out more. You can also volunteer to adopt a day on the picket line. Email Sandy Ellis at S-E-L-L-I-S at M-N-A-R-N dot org. If you're in the area, stop by the Strike HQ at 11 East Central Street, Worcester, Massachusetts, and pick up We Support the St. Vincent Nurses buttons. If you want lawn signs, fill out the form on their website. Just scroll to the bottom to find it. The MNA wants to keep the strike buzz going. You can write a letter to the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, the local newspaper. 
Finally, I want to thank the striking nurses for risking everything in their fight for patient safety. We stand with you. Well, I was stuck in bed and you were stuck here with me. But now you may go and live your lives. Go, be cute, keep gay, be crime. Bye! Julie, do the, uh, the thing. Don't freak out. It's not real.